now we can start this which of these is forward or right to the right to the arrow over there right okay. does it does it work when you go to oh, oh. I'm going to try it. Actually, I need to it started doing that thing where it's showing notes to the people. Yeah. I don't have any notes on that. I got some notes here I'm going to yeah. look um, at every now and then. I will help to you. Do it because I'm there. Because I don't see it on these screens. I almost, I've stolen your mouse since you're not using it. But this is what the people in Zoom are saying. Well, they can see there we go. Um, and I'm going to test it. Excellent. Now, I perfecto, perfecto. Okay. That we are ready. And the uh, that the camera is coming off that laptop. Oh. Oh. So I need the, to. So I'll stand here. Uh, yes. That oh, right. Stand right. And uh, does Don have a mic? Does he need a mic? He can have one. I don't think it goes directly into the but speaker. the room but the room but it yes but the room benefits exactly mm -hmm. especially if you are soft spoken I have the voice of a general no you I can't I'm the oldest child <laughs> and first powers where does this go uh arm your lapel mm -hmm. pocket pocket mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm Alan Blum. I'm the uh, uh, professor of family medicine, endowed chair in family medicine uh, at the College of Community Health Sciences at the University of Alabama School of Medicine. And uh, it's my honor to host another Art of Medicine rounds. Nell Williams, our medical librarian, and I began this series in uh, 2011. We've done over 130 of these. And uh, many of our faculty have been guests and others. We've had poets and authors and uh, painters and sculptors and, and philosophers and historians and even a filmmaker and a director. And tonight we're, we're going to go into a, a wholly uh, different realm because I'm not so certain I've been to too many talks where you're actually going to uh, experience history from someone who is there uh, at the very launch of one of the most important documents in the history of public health. The New York Public Library um, did an exhibition at the, uh, in the late 1990s and named the United States Surgeon General's Report on Smoking and Health published in 1964, exactly 60 years ago today, by Dr. Luther Terry from Alabama, who was the Surgeon General, who was recommended by uh, Senator Lister Hill, after whom the National Library of Medicine is named. Lister Hill was from Alabama. So this is an enormous Alabama connection. Dr. Luther Terry stood at a podium, and you're gonna see that again, and released this report and uh, it really marked a moment where no one could say that we didn't know everything we needed to know about smoking, we needed to take action. But in any event, you're going to try to experience that with Don Shoplin, who was there at the very, very beginning. And he, I think, I think we're neck and neck for being the longest running people involved continuously in fighting the smoking pandemic. But that in a minute, because there's a lot of people to thank, especially Nell Williams and Andrew Wright, who's done an incredible job all day today with the technical aspects. And, and has also made these uh, um, videos available online. Um, uh, Jackie Cochran uh, did 11 years ago, as the last time I think I spoke on this issue to the whole college, uh, helped enormously as she has tonight. And Bryce Callahan, my uh, incredible medical uh, pre-meds, no, he's not pre-med, he's a, he's a computer engineering student, has helped launch the exhibition that is we're also launching uh, today officially. Uh, called uh, Blowing Smoke, The Lost Legacy of the Surgeon General's Report. And that is at csts.ua.edu slash exhibitions. And you can find that and love to get some feedback. A few other people to thank, Melanie Harrell and Tyler Savage. Tyler helped design uh, our center down at the Northeast, Med Northeast Medical Building, the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society, and her assistant, Harvey Campbell, Julia Martin, uh, and Katie Oliver in the dean's office, the dean himself, Leslie Sinar, who handles uh, all the publicity and public relations, and Candace Snyder, who helps her, um, Lakeisha in rural health, Lakeisha Wiggum, and, and so many others, uh, including Kevin Bailey, who used to be our collection manager, all have participated 
in preparing for this single event, which we've had all day today. If you have time afterwards, take a look at the research posters that we've been doing at the center over the last 15 years that have been on view at national and international conferences. And uh, with that in mind, I just wanted to share a little bit about the individual whose coats are here. And um, these uh, particular coats were given to the center a few years ago by Michael Terry, who was the son of the late Surgeon General Luther Terry, who passed away in 1985. And this is what he actually wore during his four years as the Surgeon General under President Kennedy. At that time, the Surgeon General was really a pretty big mock-up, right? <laughs> he certainly was, a, was a, a major sayer in what the public health of the United States could look like. He was so strong and so so influential that during his uh, tenure, the office was downgraded. So when Dr. Koop arrived in, in the early 80s, uh, opposed, by the way, by all the public health organizations for various reasons, he made it again a bully pulpit to fight smoking and AIDS and other things that other certain generals had been a little bit reluctant to fight. Dr. Cherry was a physician, a researcher, teacher, and Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service from 1961 to 1965. He was born in Red Level, Covington County, Alabama on September 15, 1911. He received a BS uh, degree from Birmingham Southern College in 1931 and an MD from Tulane in 1935. After interning at Hillman Hospital in Birmingham, he went to city hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio for his residency. From 1943 to 1953, he was chief of the medical service of the Public Health Service Hospital in Baltimore. And from 50 to 58, he served as chief of the Clinic of General Medicine and Experimental Therapeutics at the National Heart Institute. He catapulted to public prominence in 1961 when President Kennedy appointed him as Surgeon General of the Public Health Service, a title that's been called America's Doctor, to which he provided the public with the best scientific information to help improve health and reduce the risk of illness and injury. This is the eulogy, I read this today, but I think it's worth reading again, that Secretary of Health, Joe Califano, said at Arlington National Cemetery uh, at the service for uh, Dr. Terry, I was there at the request of his wife, Janet Terry, who was a wonderful person. They were both tremendously engaging, down to earth people, and it was my privilege to know them. Great discoveries in the scientific laboratory have saved millions of lives pasteurization of milk, vaccines to eliminate smallpox and check childhood diseases, antibiotics to stamp out bacterial infections. In the first part of the 20th century, the infectious diseases these medicines conquered were the public health challenges of the day. Luther Terry's public health challenge was far more difficult. It could not be met in the tranquility of a laboratory or medical campus. This quiet private man had to face his public health challenge in public. He met that challenge. He pioneered in the recognition that one's lifestyle was the killer and crippler for the last half of the 20th century. He taught us that we could do more for ourselves than any doctor or hospital could do so. Dr. Terry did not practice public health with platitudes. He gave it to us straight and true with the first Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. And that would be this document. And uh, you can feel free to come up and afterwards look at it. But what we're gonna pass around it's a copy that Nell found and Andrew found in our library. This is the actual report. I'll hand this to Candace. Feel free to look through it. It's amazing. Now, I can't say I've read it cover to cover, but it is so well written and so well researched. You're in awe of how incredibly meticulously done this volume is. In 1979, on the 15th anniversary of the report, Surgeon General Julius Richmond published the largest report, I think, to this day. Uh, uh, that was a 15-year summary, and he focused on smoking in women. So I'm going to pass this out as well, just to give you an idea of the enormity that went into this. So thank you, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> and Dr. Richmond was here dedicating Willard Auditorium in 1979 when he was the Surgeon General. But Luther Terry was more. He was a genuine hero, a man of extraordinary courage. No powerful forces rode up to defend polio, rose up to defend polio or smallpox or unsafe milk. When Luther Terry told us of the dangers of smoking, political and financial powers of magnum force rose up to attack him. His warning was one that they tried to hide and did not want the public to talk about. But Luther Terry spoke out softly but firmly. He stood his ground, he persevered, and in the end, he revolutionized our thinking 
about the causes of modern day diseases. So I, it's my honor to introduce Don Shoplin. And it's just as well that I've misplaced the intro. Oh, let me just go grab it. I'll introduce myself. Yeah. 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 So this is actually a return engagement. When I called Don last spring to suggest this, he, he, he gladly accepted. And I can't think of enough. We've probably exchanged, I would estimate about 60 emails since then. And every time I communicate with Don, I learn something. Uh, it's just extraordinary. It's beyond anything. I've gone over all of our emails and we, it just, it's, we go back and forth and it shows you what he took to his experience with the Surgeon General that he's brought to his whole career because you, you have to be meticulous. You have to double check everything. He's been actively involved in tobacco control for more than 50 years. Now that was a 2014 that I read this. So we're not gonna talk about 60 years and anything, but that's really what we're talking about. Having worked on the original report of the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health, which also included Dr. Mickey Lemaitre, a distinguished alumnus of this university, and thus Alabama is the only state that can say it had two of the 11 people involved in the production of this report. Technically, Dr. Terry, oversaw it, but he didn't really see the final copy, as I understand it, until it was done. And this is what the strength of this committee was. Mr. Shoplin is the only individual whose name is listed as a contributor to each of the 34 reports of the Surgeon General on the health consequences of smoking published since 1967. And he did this right through 2014. I think that's, that's more than 37, but that's amazing. Nobody comes close to this. In 1965, he joined the staff of the National Clearinghouse for Smoking and Health, the predecessor agency to the US Office on Smoking and Health, which now has a $250 million budget. Their office, we had maybe 2 million at the time. And it was described to me at that time, because I went to visit them when I was just out of med school at Emory, where they were located, right next to the CDC. It was explained to me by Daniel Horn, who was one of the chief epidemiologists for that office and who co-authored one of the greatest epidemiologic works on smoking and heart disease and also smoking and cancer in the early 1950s. Dan said, when I first visited him, we're in a difficult bind. If we, if we produce something that is really going to have an impact on the tobacco industry, we'll be shut down in a minute. But if we do nothing and we just play with our you know, books and things, then they'll be suspicious that we're not doing anything. So that was the line, that was the balance that they had to take in all those years that the tobacco industry was so powerful and still is. He has also gone from the, that office on smoking health to uh, serving as technical information officer and then director of the office on smoking and health in the 1980s. He had major responsibilities for the Surgeon General's report. And then he uh, also worked closely with Dr. C. Everett Coop in 1987 he joined the Smoking and Tobacco Control Program of the National Cancer Institute, serving as overall coordinator of that program, overseeing an annual funding of over $120 million in smoking intervention research. And he was chief architect of the first NCI program, National Cancer Institute Program on Smoking Cessation, or the second one called Project Assist, which provided funding to 17 state health departments for smoking control. During his close to 60 year, well, he did 50 and then he retired, Public, a career in public health, Mr. Shoplin authored more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and other original scientific contributions on various topics. And what the heck, he's just an amazing individual. There you go. Well, Alan, um, I, was, I was getting worried. I didn't think you'd read my handwriting. Um, but let me just say a few things about what you said and uh, just to reinforce when, when Luther Terry was the Surgeon General, he was in fact the head of the entire public health service. That's what the Surgeon General did. They were the management arm and the administration arm of the entire public health service. It was after the report came out, then I think put the Surgeon General's office in the crosshairs of the politically powerful tobacco industry. And during the Johnson administration, that that office was then downgraded and they created a thing called the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and made the Surgeon General an advisor to the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and was no longer in charge of the Public Health Service. And that is true today. That is why you talk about the bully pulpit 
because the Surgeon General today, in fact, the Surgeon General since 1967 has had absolutely no authority for the Public Health Service. And I think that was a direct result of the Surgeon General's report and the fact that the tobacco industry could, could wield its way, especially in the 1960s, with what it wanted to do both with the executive office and with the legislative, legislative office as well. There's just no two ways about it. All right. Um, other things I could say about two that you said, but I'll, I'll let it pass for right now. Um, I'm going to be talking about the 64 report, obviously. Uh, you see a, a report here on the right. That's an unpublished manuscript that myself and four others have put together over the last 20 years. It started 20 years ago. And two of the people, Dr. LeMater and Dr. Farber, were committee members. And the other three of us were staff people. And we decided that, that we were going to write the inside story about what really took place to get the report done, because it's never been told before. And I think you'll find some of the things in here a little bit of a shock, because I know I did, because even though I worked on the report, I wasn't there for the entire time. And some of the events that we document in that unpublished manuscript were done before I was on staff. Um, but to really understand the 64 report, I think you got to sort of step back in history and talk about why was it that it was necessary to do a report on smoking. And we really got to go back to the beginning of the 20th century. And I'll start with Dr. Adler's book that was looking at what we knew about malignant neoplasms of the lung in 1912. And in 1912, according to, to Dr. Adler, he could only find 374 cases of the disease worldwide. Now, he, he had certain criteria that he was using, but, but the fact of the matter is it was such a rare disease that he himself said that if there's one thing that we agree upon is that it is the most rarest of cancer tumors to be found in the world, and it's been that way for some time. So how do we go from no neoplasm of the lung to where we have an epidemic by the 1940s and 1950s? I think this slide will tell you in a minute why that occurred. If you go back to 1900 and look at the patterns of tobacco use in this country, the per capita consumption was about seven and a half pounds of tobacco per person. And when you realize in 1900, it was almost all males, you can probably double that. That would give you an idea about what tobacco consumption really looked like. But the most amazing thing about it is that most of your users were chewing tobacco. It was half of all the tobacco being consumed was chewing tobacco. The other large segments are pipe smoking and cigar smoking. What we call machine-made manufactured cigarettes accounted for 0.16 of a pound, a few ounces, a few ounces. If you can see, however, by the time we started the second de decade of the, of, the of the 20th century, things changed very, very rapidly. Does anybody know what it was that changed so quickly? What the, what happened? Any, any guess? Well, the, the war came 1917, 1918. In fact, we didn't get into battle in World War I until 1918. We were really late getting in, into the war. What I'm talking about is what happened in 1913. Yeah, yeah. Anybody ever seen this ad? This is an ad for Camel cigarettes. R.J. Reynolds in 1913 was a manufacturer of smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco. In 1913, they were decided that they were going to get involved in the cigarette business. And they, they, and they produced what we now would call a modern blended cigarette. Before this, if you were talking about cigarettes, it was whatever you could get put in a tube and you'd, and you'd smoke it. A lot of it was burly tobacco, which goes into, into cigars. But they, they had a blend, including Turkish, which obviously that's where the camel connection comes in. But this ad 
was sent all around the country for months. Newspaper advertisements, magazine advertisements, posters, and it created a lot of hype. What are the camels? The camels are coming. Is the circus coming to town? What's, what's going to go on? Never mention about cigarettes. When it was finally divulged that it was cigarettes, the sales of camels just shot through the roof, literally. Just shot through the roof. And that's where you see that in, that increase in, cigarette, in, in what we call manufactured cigarettes taking place. And within a couple of years, actually within two to three years, almost every single cigarette manufacturer did the same thing. They went to this blended form of cigarette. It was a much milder smoke, had a different pH than the typical cigarettes. And a big difference was, is that with the Camel cigarette, it was a national advertising campaign. If you were around back then and tried to smoke cigarettes, the cigarettes you bought here in Tuscaloosa would be different than the cigarettes you bought in Atlanta or wherever else. It was very much a, a local or regional phenomenon. There were no national brands until Camel hit. By 1920, you had six brands and they're all fighting each other for the top spot and cigarette sales were just going through the roof. My own personal brand was Lucky Strikes. That's what I took smoking when I was in high school, by the way. Switch, I switched to Pell Mell later on because only a penny more. Yeah, it was an 80 millimeter cigarette, millimeter cigarette versus a 70. So I really was getting my money. You could buy a pack of cigarettes when I, when I was going to high school for 21 cents a pack. And if you, if you put a money in a, in a vending machine to get a pack of cigarettes out, you got the change in the wrapper. If you put a quarter and you get three pennies in the wrapper. And that's, that's where penny loafers came from. People would get their brand new pennies. Luckies and camels for the next 40 years battled each other for the top spot. Back and forth, back and forth. By 1932, more tobacco was being consumed in the form of manufactured cigarettes than all other forms of tobacco combined. So in 20 years, less than 20 years, we went from cigarettes being almost zero to where now they're the largest market share. <laughs> that, I'm sorry. Did Go the ahead. depression have any effect on the consumption of cigarettes? Did it go down because people were poor? Did, did what happen? Did the depression, depression. 1929? Yes, actually, uh, a little bit later on, I'll show a graph of per capita cigarette consumption. The first graph was 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 by weight. The weight of later on, I'll show you the the counts by you know, and you will see a dip in in cigarette consumption during the during the Great Depression. Good question. If anybody has any questions as we go through it. Don't ask, ask it. <laughs> but anyway, this if you look at, remember Isaac's uh, Adler's, you know, almost no lung cancers in 1900, 1950, we got almost 20,000 in the U.S. alone. And that's all because of the the, the difference between cigarettes in, in terms of those machine made, you know, is that you had to inhale them in order to get the effect. And that just completely changed the risk of tobacco use. You know, you were probably getting some cancers from smoking cigars, pipes, and chewing tobacco. We we know that Ulysses S. Grant died from a uh, esophageal or was that uh, a mouth oral cancer? Big cigar smoker, probably a pretty big drinker as well. But the fact of the matter is, they were small in terms of, of what happened. It, when you talk about inhaling versus puffing or chewing or whatever, when you don't inhale, it just change the risk all completely. Yeah. Now, from the 1920s to about the 1950s, there were a few reports in the published literature that actually talked about smoking and lung cancer. They got absolutely no play whatsoever. You know, the, the, the press just didn't pick up on it. We always talk about, at least we did in, in public health, of the 1950s as being the modern era of investigation of the health effects of cigarette smoking. And in 1950 itself, there were four studies published on the relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. One was a British study, and there was three in the US. Dahl and Hill, Winder and Graham were the first uh, two studies that actually showed a very distinct relationship there were two other studies, one by Morton Levine 
and I forget who the fourth study is, but it started an avalanche of research, literally, in, in the 1950s. And this was also the first time where the uh, regular press was starting to pick up on this stuff because it was happening so frequently. Whenever one of these reports would come out, the newspapers would pick it up. And also your general service magazines would pick it up, especially things like Reader's Digest and Consumer Reports and whatnot. I think Reader's Digest alone, I think they published like 17 different articles during the 1950s about some aspect of smoking and health. Uh, Consumers Reports, Consumers Union, U.S. News and World Report, all of them at some time picked up some of these studies or, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, published literature and, and made it into some type of a general purpose article that was, uh, that was designed to uh, influence the, uh, the general public. You were talking about per capita consumption. This is your Great Depression right here. But if you look at the other dip right there, where I have the, the arrow, that is the first time where we saw a dip in cigarette smoking based on the fact that it was information being transmitted to the public about the health risks of cigarette smoking. And we had a decline in per capita consumption for about two or three years running before it then took back off uh, up, up again in terms of an increase. But it showed it showed very clearly that the public responds when you put information out there that they will then act on. Uh, let me just back up real quick. So you were talking about Dan Horn and Kyler Hammond. The two individuals in the upper left-hand corner is uh, Dan Horn and Kyler Hammond of the American Cancer Society. When the first studies came out, they were called case control studies, retrospective case control studies. Uh, and that's a very uh, easy study to do in terms of it being a low cost type of a, of a study. Other investigators started doing what we called the cohort mortality studies. Uh, these, this is, these are studies where you take individuals and you enroll them in a study. They're, they're healthy. They're not in the hospital. They're not a lung cancer patient or whatever. And then you follow them over time and you record who they are, where they live, what type of occupation, uh, what type of uh, behaviors they engage in, and so on and so forth. Then you come back three, four, five years later, and, and you say, well, what happened? The, uh, the investigators from, from the UK, Richard Dahl and Bradford Hill, started the first one in, I think it was October of 1951, and they started following 34,000 British physicians in the United Kingdom. Hammond and Horn, the ACS, was the second study, and they, they started theirs about two months later, and they enrolled 188,000 white males living in nine states and followed them, I think, a total of 44 months. Uh, another investigator by the name of Harold Dorn with the National Cancer Institute started a study uh, in, in January of 1952 in which he was following 243,000 U.S. veterans that were mostly veterans of World War I who were holding government life insurance policies. And so all these studies were started and now by the middle, the latter part of the of a decade, the results are coming in and they're getting picked up by the uh, popular press whatnot as we were talking about. Well, but in 1956, the Surgeon General that, that was, uh, uh, head of the public health service, it was a guy, a guy by the name of uh, Leroy Burney, and he came in with the uh, Eisenhower administration. And Burney decided that, that what we need to do is to take a look at this, and they helped establish what they called the, the PHS study group on smoking and health. And it consisted of investigators from the Heart Association, the Cancer Society, the Cancer Institute, and the Heart Institute. And they met over a period of, I think, six days in which they reviewed the available scientific evidence. And I think at the time uh, when they met, there was now 16 studies, both retrospective and, and uh, uh, cohort mortality studies in which they could uh, uh, evaluate. And they issued a, re a report, I, forget, uh, I think it was published in 1957. And I, I wanna read the exact wording of the uh, 
What they concluded is that after, after holding six two-day meetings, they said the sum total scientific evidence established beyond reasonable doubt that cigarette smoking is a causative factor in the rapidly increasing lung cancer rate. All right. What the Surgeon General decided to do is to put the public health service on record as saying that he accepts essentially what the study group found, except a curious wording with Bernie's statement is that he said that the evidence is for excessive cigarette smoking is a causative factor, a very conservative conclusion. You know, why? We don't know. I've tried to track this down for a number of years as to as to why his statement is somewhat different because he's basing it on the public health service study group findings. And yet he, he, is, he has a very cautious statement given the, 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 the evidence at, at the time. And that's a picture of Bernie, by the way. Nice looking fellow, I think. Now we've come two years further. Now we've got more data coming in. A lot of the prospective studies are, are now out. And, and, and I think there's about, I think there's now at least six, five or six. Um, and a NCI investigator by, by the name of Michael Shimkin, and, he, and by this time, Michael Shimkin is a very outspoken critic of both this tobacco industry and the fact that we're not doing anything about the, the problem of cigarette smoking. He convinces Bernie that he needs to, to re-examine his 1957 statement and to come out with a different statement in terms of, of the public health service. And he actually publishes or helps him write a very lengthy article that they publish in the Journal of the American Medical Association toward the end of November, 1959. And his statement now changes from you know, excessive cigarette smoking. He's now making this statement. He says, the weight of evidence at present implicates smoking as the principal ideological factor in the incidence of lung cancer. So we've gone from it's a, a possible factor to where now it is the principal factor of, of, for, for lung cancer. Well, evidently that didn't sit well with the AMA. The, the newly appointed editor-in-chief of JAMA writes an editorial in which he takes Bernie to task for his statement, saying essentially you ought to mind your own business. And our friends at the tobacco industry, of course, were just more than willing to make sure that every newspaper in the country saw this statement. Because one of the things that was that was in Bernie's second statement is that not only did he make the statement about smoking being, being the cause of lung cancer, he was also suggesting or, or recommending that something be done about it. Get the public health service to do something about it. Well, the trouble is, once the industry took Talbert's statement, he, they put it all over the news, and this is what you read. You didn't read about Bernie's statement. What you're reading is, is the fact the AMA th thinks he's full of you-know-what. And that killed any chance whatsoever of the Public Health Service doing anything meaningful in terms of any kind of a public information campaign about cigarette smoking. It just killed it. The, you know, the AMA speaks for what, what is it, 400,000 physicians, I think, probably by the 1960s, you know, it carried a lot of weight. But and it was a single factor that that's why we didn't do anything. You know, he, he was just he was just overwhelmed. So let's go forward now another year and a half. New administration. Kennedy comes into office. He appoints Luther Terry as a Surgeon General. And within a couple of months, the major volunteer, at least four of the major voluntary agencies, writes a letter to the president and say, Mr. President, you know, we think that you really ought to appoint a blue ribbon commission to take a look at cigarette smoking. So of course, Kennedy's White House sends a note over to the Department of Health, Education and Welfare and says, you know, what should we do about this? Well, an undersecretary gets the, the uh, incoming letter and drafts a response that says that essentially, well, you know, the, the president campaigned on an issue of trying to get rid of as many of these independent commissions and committees as he possibly can 
And that's what the response is that they, they sent back to the four volunteers. So nothing happened. But in September of that year, a few months later, Dr. Harold Deal is appointed the uh, president of the American Cancer Society. What, what does they last? A year, two years as, as president? I think it's an annual thing. Annual thing. Every year they... and, and, and Deal, uh, at this time, he's sort, of, he's sort of like Shimkin. He's already on, on board in terms of something that ought to be done about smoking. A, a couple of years later, he'll write a book called Tobacco and Health that talks about the politics of smoking and whatnot. It's just a few years after this. Anyway, Deal isn't deterred by the non-response they got from the White House but this time he sends a letter to the department rather than to the White House and says, gee, you know, can you meet with us and talk to us about it? We think something ought, ought to really be done about it. Well, not, unfortunately, the uh, secretary at that time, I think it was, it was Abraham Rubikoff, uh, was the, uh, the secretary, and he did nothing. It just languished in, in his office. So just Connecticut like, uh, was where he was from. In Connecticut, believe it or not, is a tobacco state. Yeah, it raises uh, shade, shade creek tobacco. Shade creek tobacco. Highest shade tobacco for yeah. cigars in the world. It's for cigar wrappers, I think, what, what it is. We digress. He became yes. a senator. He became a United States senator. So, uh, where was it before I so rudely interrupted? Uh, By yourself. Yeah, there I am. There I am. So, um, so uh, Harold Deal. He gets no response. So the ACS Board of Directors is meeting the next month. And the ACS Board of Directors say, well, I think we can do something about this. And so they make a contact with the, with the department as well, except what they did this time is that they threatened to publish the letters to both Kennedy and to Ribicoff as a way of embarrassing the administration for not taking any action or even giving, giving them a response. Well, that at least got something going because at that point, now the request is actually sent down to, of all people, Luther Terry. Luther Terry. At this point, he had he probably hadn't seen any of these things going back and forth because it's above his level. Okay, so uh, Luther decides that well, he'll go ahead and meet with the volunteers, which he does on was it January the fourth, a couple of months later, and we don't have any record as to what took place, but we assume that they were just bending his ear and saying, "Well, you know, maybe you ought to do something." So then, at that point. Uh, Terry actually contacts the secretary's office. We don't know whether it's in writing or whether they had a, a meeting or whatnot. And he says, I agree with what the voluntary said. We really need to take a look at this uh, issue and have some kind of a, of, a, of a national commission to examine the issue. Well, again, absolutely nothing happens. The secretary, even after he's talked to Luther Terry, doesn't, doesn't do anything either. Right. So but we, we bypass the uh, in the cock, you know, that's just a, a, a side thing. So we, we, we now come up to March of 1962. And a little uh, report is issued by the Royal College of Physicians in London, 70 pages, if I recall correctly. And it's a very good report. It lays out the evidence uh, quite succinctly and shows that smoking has a cause and effect relationship with lung cancer and chronic bronchitis and a couple of the diseases was associated with a coronary artery disease. And this gets a lot of play both in London and in, in the US, even though the, the tobacco industry in this country was trying to its best to sort of uh, blunt it with its usual arguments. So it's the only statistics and you can't prove anything by anything about statistics, whatnot. But it got a lot, it got a lot of press. And it got a lot of attention by one particular senator. Her name was Maureen Newberger. And, and she's kind of a, uh, uh, an odd person in history in, in some respects. Her husband had died in office. He was a senator. And she was appointed to take his remainder of his term. I think in 1960, she ran on her own and was elected. And so here she is now. She's still pretty much a freshman uh, uh, senator. But she takes on... Uh, consumer affairs as, as one of her priorities and cigarette smoking really catches her eye. And so she decides that, you know, she's now going to take this on as her own personal vendetta against the cigarette industry. 
Um, she actually sponsors with six other co-sponsors a Senate joint resolution that calls for the establishment of a national commission. And she also, at the same time, contacts the Federal Trade Commission saying, well, wait a minute, what are you guys doing about this stuff? Isn't this in your bailiwick? You know, and, and she also had no problem with ringing Luther Terry's bell either, because according to what I've understood is that if a week went by and Terry's office didn't hear from Senator Newberger, they thought she didn't love him anymore, you know, because she was constantly calling and trying to put pressure on the public health service to do something about cigarette smoking. Well, one thing that Luther does is that he now puts together a fairly detailed, what we would call a, a decision memo, in which he sort of spells out the need for this national review. And he, and he lists seven different reasons as to why it would be very timely. And it's all the same stuff. You know, here's the Royal College of Physicians. We have congressional interests. The Federal Trade Commission has an interest in it. There are new studies. There are other governments taking issue. And he sends that up the line to, uh, again, his boss, who is still Secretary Ribicoff. And again, nothing happens. It just sits. We don't even have any record of it going from his office to the White House. Because Terry, in his memo to the secretary, says, you know, if you take action on this, you probably need to check with the White House because it has certain political sensibilities to it, plus it has an effect on what we call an important industry. But we have no record that ever went anywhere other than the secretary's office. And we don't know what would have happened if that's all that occurred in terms of whether there would have been any kind of advisory committee except we come to a May 23rd press conference of John F. Kennedy. growing concern here and abroad. And I think this has largely been provoked by a series of independent scientific investigations, which have concluded that cigarette smoking and uh, certain types of cancer and heart disease have the cause of connection. I have two questions. Do you and your health advisors agree or disagree with these findings? And secondly, what, if anything, should or can the federal government do? And the stock market is in sufficient yeah. difficulty. Yeah. Well, that question changed everything because Kennedy and his administration now goes back over to the department and says, What gives? What are they talking about? Of course, he was really referring to the Royal College of the Physicians report, you know, but it got action. The, the lucky thing is because Luther had just sent up his detailed proposal in terms of, you know, what he'd like to do and the reason he'd like to do it. He just dusted that off and sent it up, and two days later it was approved. So in, in the matter of 48 hours, he had his approval to establish a, a, an advisory committee. The ironic thing about it is that all the other proposals up to this last proposal had talked about a national blue ribbon committee or something of that nature. In his last proposal, Luther says, we'd like to have an advisory committee to the Surgeon General. And the first time that actually had been approached. That's, that's an important distinction, you know. Thank you, Mother. <laughs> uh, because it now meant that the committee itself would be advising the Surgeon General and he would not be obligated to actually accept that report. It gave him an out if, the, if, if, if whoever the committee that he was going to appoint didn't do maybe the job that he wanted. It, would, it actually literally gave him an out. Any questions? This is the, the press release announcing that he was going to establish an advisory committee. This is the date of June the 7th, right? President Kennedy had a press conference the same day in which the question came up. He just referred to the, to the Surgeon General's statement. The thing that, that, the reason this is important is he talks about 
that they're going to establish a kind of a work group now that is going to outline the parameters of the study and who should be on this committee and who are we going to include as part of that planning process? The tobacco industry. And it, it, it you talk about something that people just reacted to negatively. It was that. I was going to read a bunch of letters, but unfortunately I, I forgot to read them or bring them. Uh, but I'll just talk about it very briefly. They met for two days. Uh, now, these, this, this is where the voluntary health agencies, a bunch of the public health service people, the FTC, the White House was had, had a representative there. Uh, Kenneth Clark was the representative. Do you know who Kenneth Clark is? United Nations, United Nations Ambassador. Ken Kenneth Clark was, was important in, in the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Uh, he, he had actually had studied dolls black dolls, white dolls, and then told children which doll was the, the right doll, which doll was the good doll, which doll was a black doll. And that was a lot of what went into the Board of Education that was actually to show systematic racism because the black kids picked the white dolls. But Kenneth Clark was in the White House right, as well as, so we had all kinds of representatives and we had two representatives from the tobacco industry. We had Clarence Cook Little from the TIRC and industry research council tech, thank you and uh, we had i don't think who's the yeah, second guy was anyway he was he was from the uh wasn't doing or was the i'll think about it later on it makes no difference anyway they were part of the planning process so they came up with the fact well we're gonna do that we're gonna do this in two phases phase one will be a look at the magnitude and nature of the health threat and phase two will be recommendations thereof and they decided that we won't do phase two until phase one is complete. They also drew up the criteria in terms of who they wanted to serve. And, and this is the thing that, that drew a fire of a lot of people. And you, and you wouldn't do it today under any circumstance. But number one, they said that you could not be part of any organization or group. You, know? uh, you had to be free of any, any particular investigator type bias. And you could not have taken a stand on the issue either for or against, which means you pretty much eliminated anybody who's done any research on the area. So we were going to appoint a committee of experts, but they're not going to be experts in smoking and health. I said, can you imagine doing a study nowadays that looked at, say, climate change? And you're not going to appoint anybody on that committee that knows a damn thing about climate change. That was essentially what he did, that, or that's essentially what the group did. So on the second day, the uh, everybody was was allowed to submit names for consideration to serve on the committee, and I think the the totals that I saw from that group was that they had 155 names, and from that 155 is where they were going to now choose uh, the members of, of the committee. Five names at, at the next meeting they were, was eliminated. Uh, I asked Peter Hamill, who was the medical coordinator and, and was the singular person who was responsible for choosing and vetting all the committee members. He says the tobacco industry did not eliminate anybody. We don't, we don't know who the five is, uh, and we don't know what the reason were, but they didn't have to give a reason. Luther Terry gave them a complete veto power. You could eliminate a name for any reason whatsoever. It did not have to give a reason. So that was the study outline. These are some of the letters I was going to read. So now we come up to, uh, to the point to where the committee isn't, isn't established yet, but Luther Terry announces staff appointments that are now going to serve on the committee. One is Dr. Herman Craybill, who's a senior scientist with the National Cancer Institute. He works in the, in the field studies branch, you know, and has for a number of years. Uh, and he's going to be the executive director of the study. And he's going to have the overall responsibility for the management and the implementation of the study. And they expected him to serve almost as a committee member. He was going to sit on all the meetings and take part of the discussions and whatnot. The other uh, uh, major appointment is Dr. Peter Hamill here on the right. And Peter's going to be the medical coordinator. And he's going to be the go-between between between the staff and the committee to make sure everybody has everything they need. If the committee needs something, then he'll go back and make sure that the uh, staff can get it uh, done and, and so on and so forth. Dr. Crabo goes back to his hometown in Pennsylvania and he gives an interview to a reporter. 
And he says, essentially, you know, I think smoking causes lung cancer and associated with heart disease. And, and if you were rating it, uh, I'd give a non-smoker a one. And if I smoked, a, if you smoked a cigar, a pipe, you'd be rated a two. And if you smoked cigarettes, you would be six or seven. So it, what, what do you mean? Smoking is bad for you. Didn't we just say the criteria was nobody could take a stand on the issue? Well, it didn't take long for the industry to find out about it. And Craybill was fired. You know, the worst part about it is that he was never replaced during the entire study. Hamill had to almost try to do both jobs, which was an impossible. You couldn't have done the medical coordinator's job by yourself without a bunch, a lot of help. And here he was trying to, to serve both jobs. It, it was an impossibility. He pushed Luther Terry several times to, to appoint him. And for whatever reason, Luther never re, never appointed anybody to replace Crable. And unfortunately, it, it, it had an effect on this study. It had an effect on the study. I don't think the study would have taken as long if Craybill had been in there. He was with the National Cancer Institute, which back then as it is now was one of the larger operating components within the public health service and had both the budget and the people and the resources and the money that could have made a difference if you brought it to bear on this study. Hamill was a chief epidemiologist with the division of air pollution control. He controlled no budget whatsoever. Crabo had a big budget. He could have he could have made a, a big difference, but he just was never replaced. Hamill was the person that Terry charged with going through the 150 names and choosing and vetting the 10 members that eventually served. He did a very extensive interview with the JFK Library Oral History Project, which he did in 1969. So it was just a few years after the report was done. And it, and it was a five-day interview, very extensive interview. If you ever have a chance to read something, it's hard to read because it's unedited, you know, but you'll get a real sense of some of the problems that he was faced with trying to harness this committee into a unified working group, you know? And he also goes into the criteria, his own criteria in terms of who he was looking for in terms of the right mix of talent, experience, and, and whatnot. And as, as I've, I've characterized it, I said, if we were talking about this today, I said, he was probably looking for somebody who was gonna be able to think outside the box. You know, even though these were gonna be uh, people that were experts in their own discipline, but they weren't smoking and health experts. You know, and yet he's trying to now bring them into a into a group to where now they're gonna have to sift through 7,000 studies, which are the number of studies approximately that were that were available at the time that the committee was formed. I don't think the public health service, I don't think the committee was even aware that the database was that large. Yeah. And now here you can have this group of experts that have now got to find some way to sift through all these studies and make sense of them without having any sort of background in it whatsoever. I don't know how you would feel about it, but somebody said, here's 7,000 studies, summarize it for me. You know, it, it drive you crazy. You couldn't do it. But he, 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 Peter was essentially the architect and the driving force and un, unsung hero, if there is one, for the 64 report. He had to leave the project at the end of July on advice of his physician. He had a very painful neck condition, you know, and he was just totally exhausted. And he was had to leave immediately without any transition between he and his predecessor, a guy by the name of Dr. Uh, Eugene Guthrie. And Guthrie was called in cold to the project in, in, in September of 1963 to finish up everything, not having had any involvement in the project whatsoever. The one thing that, that Gene Guthrie had, because he was head of what that was called the Division of Chronic Disease in the Bureau of State Services, and it was one of the larger operating components in the Public Health Service, and he was able to bring in a lot of his staff to finish at work on the report. Something that Crabo could have done, 
if Crabill was there during that period of time. You know, if Guthrie hadn't come in when he did and, and who he was and his management style, because he cracked the whip on, on the committee because they were sort of, at this point, dragging their feet a little bit. You know, that report might have been out in, you know, 1966. But Peter just deserve, deserves a lot of credit on the, on the very front end. These are the 10 members he chose. But I won't go through them. Seven of them were tobacco users. Five were cigarette smokers. One was a cigar smoker. One was a pipe smoker. So you talk about coming in without any bias. That alone would show you, you know, that they're that they're users. And so the, any bias, they they probably did not want to believe that the thing they're going to study is as bad as it is. And so I can keep on. So, uh, uh, Len Schumann said that. I don't know if you know what Len, Len Schumann, who's an epidemiologist with the U University of Minnesota. He said, I was going to prove him that they were wrong, that there was nothing wrong with smoking. I think he was a pack and a half a day smoker. Uh, uh, Peter Hamill was. Did he give up smoking? He did. He did. He did. Right, right after the report was issued, actually. Yeah. And this is how they produced the report. It, it's, um, this is a kind of a, a working schematic. Uh, they, they found out early on because there was so much data that there was going to be massaged, they knew they couldn't do it themselves. So they, they formed all these little ad hoc work groups, subcommittees, and a lot of these overlapped. You know, the lung cancer group and the lung carcinogenesis group and the pulmonary group. And you, know, you had some people that were serving on, on multiple of these things. So they were able to get this cross fertilization of both ideas as well as the evidence itself because so much of this stuff is tied into one another, you know. And they pretty much relied on these groups. I think if you look at the report and look at the acknowledgements, they had about 150 consultants that actually produced something for them at some point in time for their consideration. And then they would use the, the meetings of the full committee to look at the, at the different reports that came in from the consultants as a way of actually then massaging that uh, to their liking from the standpoint of how did this all, all this stuff fit in as they were uh, going through and evaluating the uh, the evidence themselves. And though he's not mentioned as one of the, those consultants, Dr. Winternitz, who was the father of our own uh, late Dr. Winternitz here, was listed as an author of one of the studies that is in this book. Oh, we are. There's a connection. Hmm. Small world. <laughs> this is where the committee met. This is where I started working. This is the National Library of Medicine. It's on the NIH campus. It used to be downtown DC. They, in June of 1962 or you know, April of 1962, moved out to this gorgeous facility on the NIH campus when the NIH campus was just gorgeous. Now it's nothing but buildings and uh, asphalt. You know, uh, At the time that this was erected, they had, we had 14.3 miles of shelves that was filled with medical textbooks and whatnot. All of it was underground. It was three floors and all the collection was underground. Now, we're, this was a building that was built at the very height of the Cold War. And believe it or not, this pagoda type thing, that pagoda type shape on the top was designed so that if there was a nuclear attack, I'm not making this up, but it was designed if there's a nuclear attack, it would implode on top of it kill everybody in it, but of course the books would be saved. But the books would be saved. But us poor peons, we'd have been... You know. Priorities. Anyway, they met 12 times. The first meeting was downtown, all the others, except for one that we had at a, at a, at a motel when Gene Guthrie took over. But all of them were in the basement of the Library of Medicine. We were in the very, very basement. We were on what we call sea level, three floor below ground. You felt like a mole. And this is, this is where they were meeting. They had erected these temporary structures for the staff and, and for me. The, uh, the light you see is actually the stack area, you know, where the, the journals that were for 1946 and before were, were you know, they, they were very seldom used. All the current journals were up on A floor. So we're three floors below ground. And this is the structure they met in, which we affectionately called the staff. We called it the bullpen. You know, and this is where they would meet and discuss 
and write the report. Business. Nope. As you can see, the walls are only six feet tall. It's open at the top. There's no doors. Yeah. And our offices were right next to it, about maybe 20 feet away. You know, some of the debates were shouting matches. <laughs> I tell you that right. They were shouting matches. You know, they would, they got so angry at times, and it wasn't unusual. You'd look up, you know, trying to do it, and here's a committee member coming into your office, you know, either having a cup of coffee or a cigarette, they just had to get away from it. You know, and I said, and we they met on the weekend with and the staff was there the whole weekend. For a lot of the core staff that were there for the entire period, it wasn't unusual because everything was borrowed. They had a very small number of what we called core staff that were hired at the very beginning, and everybody else was borrowed from other agencies on an as-needed as needed basis. Some of the core staff would turn in time cards to where they had more overtime than regular time. It was such a long hour. And weekends were no exception. Mm -hmm. I don't know, from the time that I started working full-time, I think it was sometime in August, I never remember not working on the weekend. The only time we had off was Thanksgiving and Christmas Day, and we took the uh, part of the afternoon off the day of Kennedy's funeral to watch it on TV. And that was the only time that I can remember being off, not at least working on that project. It, it was it, to say it was intense, you know, but just interesting, man. I'll tell you. Well, Don, one of the reasons for the intensity was it not that they had agreed initially that there would be no minority report. Yeah, so and that I, meant that every decision they made had to be made where they were 100% all in agreement, and that led to some problems with perhaps the most important omission, addiction. Yeah, they, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, I'll, I'll start talking about that right now because I'm going to talk about the infamous May meeting because some of that comes to play in this. And this is something that very few people have ever heard. It's never been publicized. In the, at the March meeting, this is Dr. James Hunley. He's the Assistant Surgeon General, and he chaired or co-chaired every single meeting. Luther Terry was only at the first three meetings, usually for an hour or two. But he was more than, he, for the very first meeting, he was there for about half a day. But by and large, James Hunley was the one who chaired all the meetings of the, of the, of the advisory committee. A lot of people will say that he was the, Best things since sliced bread. He was a great manager, all this kind of. If you talk to Mickey Lemater and some of the other people, he never got what they were about. He just never really comprehended, you know, and was always pushing them. Conclusions. What are your conclusions? What do you think we can do? When can the report come out? What not? This is back in March. We still have a long way to go, but at the March meeting, he actually toward the end of the meeting. Uh, passes out a diagram or like a flow chart. And he says, well, it looks to me like where we are and where we're headed that we'll probably have the report out by the end of the year. And the committee discussed it and said, yeah, it's, that's pretty real of us. Probably pretty much what we're thinking too. So at the March meeting, everybody's working toward the end of the year as, as, as the goal. May the 4th is a Saturday. The committee shows up for its, its meeting in the morning. And when they walk in, they knew something was sort of up. Because up to this point in time, there have been, there's been a bunch of government observers sitting in on every meeting. They've allowed government you know, from different agencies because that was part of the, the original agreement. They walk in this morning, there's no, there's no observers. And Dr. Hunley announces we're going to go into an executive session, which is pretty rare itself. He's also asked the staff that sat now nearby in that in, in the bullpen area to leave. He only wants the committee there and Dr. Hamill himself. And he proceeds to tell them that we got to get the report out now. And I'll give you two options. One. You finish the report up now, and we issue it. Stop your work now. Two, turn it over to the public health service staff and let them finish it for you. Regardless of which option you choose, 
the report has to be put out now or put out soon at least, very short period of time. Now in May of 1963, the cancer chapter is in total disarray because Dr. Burdett who has taken all the responsibility of writing the cancer, cha cancer chapter, can't get over his love for genetics. And a lot of the report is concentrated on the etiology of lung cancer by genetics. And the epidemiology that described this motion of prudence, but the relationship between smoking and lung cancer is just not as prominent. They've asked for several revisions, he makes an attempt to make revisions, but not a whole lot has changed. So the cancer chapter is in complete disarray. The uh, analysis of the six major perspective studies, and this is one of the first times uh, this would be called, a, I guess nowadays it might be called a meta-analysis, where they actually went back to all the investigators of the different prospective studies and got their raw data so they could then cut that information and look to see what they could do with it as they combine the results from those six studies. A seventh was added later on. The seventh study that was added was an ACS study in which they had information on a million men and women, million and men and women they've been following. Largest study ever done, as far as I know, to this day. A million, that, that was a large perspective study. So, so the so the work on the on the mortality of go into the overall mortality chapter hasn't even been written yet because they're still looking at the data. <laughs> Probably equally as important. Are you all familiar with the criteria for causality? Have you ever heard the term? Nobody. Well, they had when the advisory committee was was first set up set up. One of the things that they soon realize is that if they were going to make a difference in terms of how they're going to evaluate the data, it wasn't going to be enough just to evaluate the data. We're going to have to come up with some criteria that shows how we applied that data. And so they had a meeting, and actually the meeting took place in June. So at this point in time, that meeting had even taken place. And they were, and that came up with the criteria for causality which talked about the consistency of the association, the uh, temporality, uh, the strength of the association. What's the, what's, I'm missing one. Anyway, they, so they were gonna, that was the criteria was gonna be then applied at the end of the study that allowed them to make conclusions as to whether smoking was a cause of lung cancer. It had to meet this criteria, you know? And it's one of the reasons, in addition to, uh, what Alice said about you no know, minority report, but it's one of the reasons why a lot of the conclusions in that report are fairly conservative. They were considered even conservative back then by virtue of the fact that they didn't quite meet the criteria when they sat down as a group in November and have tried to apply that criteria to the evidence that, as they saw it. And that meeting didn't take place until, until June. It, it was written on the back of a cigarette pack, believe it or not. True, true story. True story, around the back of a cigarette pack. So in the main meeting, here Dr. Hunley is saying, we got to finish up the report now. And they're, they're not even midway through the, through the study. Well, to say that the committee was shocked is, is probably a gigantic understatement. They kicked Hunley out of the meeting and said, we're going to go into our own executive session. Well, first of all, they, they had pressed Hunley. What does Terry know about it? He didn't say anything. Did Terry approve? Again, he didn't, didn't really respond to it. So anyway, they kicked he and Hamill both out of the meeting and they go into their own executive session. And for 90 minutes, bantered back and forth trying to figure out what's going on. Who pushed for this to happen? Who pushed and said, we've got to have to? Give me five minutes, Give me maybe seven. Couldn't They couldn't come up with any logic to it. So they call Hamill back in, you know, think, well, we'll go over another round of questions, you know, how did this happen? Who authorized it? Hamill doesn't, or uh, he, I mean, uh, 
Huntley never really responds to them. Again, they said, we want to meet with Terry. He's not available. What does Terry know? He didn't respond. So they kick him back out again. And this time they're really angry. They are so angry that they've decided that if the report's going to be done, it's going to be done by us and us alone. We're not going to allow anybody, not the Surgeon General, not the Department, nor the White House, nor anybody else, to see that report until we publish it. And, it will, and we, and we alone, will not just be responsible for every conclusion, but every word in the report. They call Hundley back in. Uh, Dr. Bain Jones, who was the elder statesman of the, of the group, was the person who was asked to speak for the group. And he told Hundley, that uh, this is what the story is. You know, it's going to be our report, our report alone. And if you guys don't like it, we're going to all resign today and we're going to go to the press and let them know what you guys have done. And she called me back out again for the third time and said, we'll wait, we'll wait for your reply. According to what, I wasn't there. It happened before I got on board. But according to Mickey Lemaitre, who I talked to at great length about this, he said it took Hunley about three minutes to decide. And he came back in and did his mea culpas and said that he accepts their decision and that uh, you know the report would be done by the committee, not by us or the public health service. But, want, but wants to know if I can still work with you. They relented and said, yeah, you can you can still be here. But after that, I can tell you from everything that I've heard is that the relationship between the committee and Dr. Hundley, and, I, and I'd and i have to say probably the public health leadership at that time was pretty much in the toilet. But, you know, we could have we could have not had a report. Could have easily not had a report. It could have just blown up in our face. Yeah. But the the committee was they they, they were a very independent group, you know, and they and they they and they told Hunley, or, the, or during the discussions when they actually I guess when they cooked, kicked Hunley out, you know, they reiterated he said let's not forget, we're an advisory committee to the Surgeon General. We don't have to answer to the Surgeon General. We're we're our own boss. You know, we don't have to respond. We don't have to be responsible to ourselves. So that's when they decided that you know absolutely no one was going to see this report. There had been reports, by the way, uh, uh, in, if you ever get a hold of the November issue of uh, News, is it Newsweek? So, you know they talk about the report. That, you know that from the committee is going to go to the Public Health Service, then probably to the desk of John Kennedy, the cigar smoking John Kennedy, for approval. Not not after May. I don't know if I don't know if it, was, if it was ever designed to where they were going to have to, you know, submit it through channels, so to speak. But after the May meeting, uh, they decided that, that the report would be theirs and theirs alone. We're put we're putting our name behind it, and so therefore we're going to be the only ones that have any say so in it. So to answer your question, your guess is as good as mine. Did did Terry know? I would I would suggest you read Peter Hamill's interviews. Uh, Peter Hamill was pretty blunt. He was pretty blunt about a lot of things, including the fact that he never got the support from the front office that he thought he should have gotten. Uh, he thought that uh, Terry and Hunley connived on this issue. You know, uh, He complained about not having enough staff from day one. You know, Crabill thing was just one, was just one aspect of it. He was always being saddled with when we, when we say barred staff, you, you and I both know you're not going to let your best employee go down and work for six months on this advisory committee thing. But, you know, George over here, oh, God, George, you know, let George go. He's worthless anyway. He's just taking up space. Let George go. And that's kind of staff. We were a lot of the staff that we were dealing with. Aren't that was it. You had to work around. It. Where were you appointed from? <laughs> well, I was part of the, I was part of the barred staff, but except, uh, 
you know, the, the, the irony is, is that I had been working in for overtime in the evening for a couple of, probably a couple of months, you know, and uh, so then I, I was told I could be appointed full time for the committee. And I didn't find out later that, that actually Luther Terry had to write a letter to the director of the NLM to get me to do it because they weren't going to let me go. And I, I'd only been working there for seven, eight months. You know, I was just a kid, just out of high school. You know? I guess, are we running way over? I don't know, but I hear you talking about this and how it was done and everything manipulated. And you could take the cancer and smoking out of that right now and you could insert two other things that have been happening in the medical field recently. I'm not I'm just saying. And it's almost verbatim what happened to it is what you're describing, right? Shocking. I know. We Shocking. Repeating it, sir. Shocking. I can't believe it would happen. Well, the other thing that people don't know about the report is that it was a top secret document. When they were so afraid that contents of the report were going to be leaked prematurely, that we had all kinds of security making sure that things stayed in the area and, and, and didn't get leaked. Once we had the final text and we we're getting ready to send it to to be printed. Um, I don't know if maybe if y'all ever have ever, ever seen a galley proof. Mm -hmm. Do you know what a galley proof is? Well, back in the 60s, you know, of course everything was done on typewriter, didn't know, didn't know anything it was. And you took typewriter type and you took it down to the printers and you said, here, we're, we're gonna print this. Well, that with a report it was the same way, except to make sure that security was or that we had an added layer of security. We actually did all the, the pre-printing, the galley printing, the galley proofs, and the page proofs at night after hours. And we did it at five different printers so that no printer had the whole report. And I don't forget how many forays we actually had to do, but we also took a senior staff person down there with them. And any scraps of paper that were generated as a result of this, uh, you know, when they're generating both the galleys and the page proofs had to be put in burn bags because you didn't want any of these scraps of paper, you know, getting loose and somebody, you know, whatever. So they did the same thing with the page proofs. So we had some of the galley proofs of, available. Thanks, Mom. Uh, the, the, the committee met last, right before Christmas, the, the 22nd, 23rd of Christmas. 23rd of December was the last meeting of the advisory committee. We had some of the galley proofs available then for them to take a look at and, and read through but not for the front matter because we were still putting that stuff into into final uh, formats and, and whatnot you know all that was done between christmas and the end of the year in order to get the report done so that we could have copies printed in time for the uh, for the 11th and copies weren't really delivered until i think it was either three or four o'clock friday afternoon is when those copies got delivered to the state department auditorium for the for for release the next day, but people just don't know what you had to go through in order to read these galley proofs. And every time you did one of these things, you know the printer would introduce new errors because it's you know it's cold set type. You know everything gets changed around every time they they did another run, and so it, it, you talk about a Christmas that wasn't a Christmas. You know we were it was some long hours. You know I think. Uh, I think we I think we all went in Christmas Day, as a matter of fact, or at least a little bit. But these are just examples of page proofs and gallet proofs. This is the actual press conference at the State Department Auditorium. Uh, that's the committee sitting up on stage. Uh, you can see Dr. Terry flanked by uh, Dr. Guthrie, who I talked about earlier, and Dr. Hundley. So what's what's the impact of the report? We, we've talked about some of them. I think probably the most important is that for once and for all, it answered the, or stopped the medical controversy, first and foremost. But uh, one of the other things is that there's a number of, of different pieces of legislation passed, labeling, which is more of a victory for the tobacco industry than it probably was for us. It was a very weak label. Plus it had preemption built into it. So the Congress only reserved the right to do something about cigarette advertising by the Congress, 
The FTC couldn't do anything. The states couldn't do anything. It just preempted everybody. So the, the as somebody said, the best filter yet for the tobacco industry was Congress because they just pretty much got what they wanted. But it did jumpstart a much broader and more unified public health effort to do something about cigarette smoking, you know, and cigarette related uh, diseases. What were we talking about? Per capita consumption. Oh, these are some. Oh, the other part of the legislation is that it called for an annual report by the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare on the health consequences of smoking. They they just by tradition we just called it the Surgeon General's reports, and these are just some of the uh, covers. The other thing we're talking about per capita consumption. Nineteen sixty three is the peak of per capita consumption in this country. 64 report came out next year. It cut off the, the continued increase in per capita. It's never, it's never recovered from that, from that peak. We are down now in 2022, I think, at a little over 800 cigarettes per capita versus 4,345 in 1963, an 80% reduction. Although I'm up in my here out of here, I'm here Alan, except 60 years. It's taken us 60 years to achieve that, two gen more than two generations. Well, I used to say that, uh, sure, I mean, uh, we're gonna get people to stop one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and it turns out that figure is 20 million people who, might have uh, lived longer and healthier lives had they not smoked cigarettes. So I, I don't see this even as a glass half full. I see it as an abysmal public health failure. The success was Don and the team that produced the surgeon's report. That was the success. And even Kennedy gets partial credit for that because he let it go through. Lyndon Johnson almost didn't let it go through. And Lyndon Johnson never endorsed this report. Guess who was his chief legal advisor? His name was Abe Fortas. Abe Fortas was nominated to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by Lyndon Johnson, and he had to resign over what would be considered today, I hate to use the word, Clarence Thomas, but maybe one little one tenth of one percent of what is rumored to have been taken by wealthy people from other states. It was twenty thousand dollars, and and at Fortas, one of his chief clients was the tobacco industry. So uh, we knew that, uh, retrospectively, that he advised Johnson to just either let this go through, but not going to act on it. And it never was acted. I went to the LBJ Library, where the exhibition uh, that right, we did in the Gorgas Library here uh, traveled to the LBJ Library in 2014. None of the other presidential libraries would want this exhibition. The Carter Library, which we thought would be most eager since Jimmy Carter, after he was president, was very anti-smoking, not while he was president. He actually fired Secretary Califano for starting an anti-smoking campaign. So I wrote to that library, I wrote to Rosalind Carter, and, and, and I, Carter is the only president I ever met because he had a retreat on smoking that I was invited to. But Carter's people and the head of the library there said, no, we're not interested, flat out. I still don't know why. At Clinton's library was the second we tried. And they didn't know anything, the staff there didn't know anything that Clinton never done on smoking. That was difficult to go and explain to them but they did invite me, and they were very, very proud of the fact they gave me free admission to the Clinton Library. Um, the JFK Library, my close friend Patrick Whalen knows the director, he started the Catholic Democrats, and he's the, he wrote to the head of the JFK Library and said, why don't we have this exhibition there? He never got a response. So as a last gasp, even though I knew he didn't endorse the report, I wrote to the LBJ Library, and they said, yeah, sure, let's do it. But in any event, uh, no administration, at least of all Lyndon Johnson, ever really did anything. So one day while I was at the LBJ Library in Austin, I asked them if I could, they could set aside some time for me to go to the library and look through all the material they must have had on the smoking issue. And they brought two little boxes with about 10 or 15 letters from the public. That was it in the entire LBJ presidential library. So down the street, maybe a mile, we have uh, maybe a thousand times more uh, than anywhere else of original documentation about this report and other things. So we have uh, the largest collection in the world of original documentation and everything else about the tobacco issue anyway. So again, uh, the success was the issuance of the report. As you said earlier, the second part, 
of the remedial action was the last 60 years. So it's it just it took too long to do what we needed to do. Yes, I'm almost through. This, these are just slides that shows you changes in prevalence. We're now down to actually it's 11.2 percent. We have early release data for the uh, 2022. But again, as we talk today, as one form of tobacco goes down, others go up. And that industry is in command. They still want their sales figures. So if you looked at the New York Stock Exchange from 1957 to 2007, when one of the 30 stocks that makes up the Dow Jones average that your own retirement accounts are counting on was Philip Morris, the most profitable single stock in the New York Stock Exchange from 1957 to 27 was Philip Morris. More profitable than any other stock on the exchange, more dividends, more profit. And we in universities and our retirement funds have benefited from that. Just one example of how they always are dynamic. They always have been able to, to fight off all those funny duddies that don't want people to smoke. This is just showing the kids' data, down to around 2%. Remarkable, they were up around 30% at one time. Cell phones every place, cigarettes. <laughs> so not, I'll take the cigarettes. Not 1990. I'll take the cigarettes. And then last but not least, and this is one that I will take personal credit for, uh, the 1986 report is the last report that I had direct responsibility for, and that was looking at what we called involuntary smoking. And we concluded in that report that it was re that, that involuntary exposure is in fact the cause of lung cancer and other diseases in non-smokers. In 1986, only 3% of workers said that their workplace was smoke-free. Within six years, you can see how quickly it rose. Now, eight out of 10 workers say that their workplace is smoke-free. That, that's a sea change. And I think that more than anything it is part of the social environment. It, 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 it probably can get people to either quit or cut down or reduce their consumption quicker than anything else you can do, maybe even quicker than taxes in some respects. Definitely. But if you look around, you know, how quickly that actually occurred, you know, first it was airplanes, we got off airplanes, but within a very short number of years, almost everything went smoke free. I don't know if what, but you all, but I go, I live in Georgia, which doesn't have a very small, uh, strong ordinance or law or whatever. I, I can't, there's no place I can think of that I've been to in the last 15 years where there was anybody smoking inside. It's so this just is the good news. Complete sheet chain. When you can't smoke, you don't. But what's the bad news? We work in this environment as healthcare professionals and we don't fully appreciate that there's a heck of a lot of people that are still smoking out there. There's 28 million people in the United States that are still smoking and beginning to use other products that are not gonna be guaranteed to reduce harm, even though that's what the industry's party line is. A review, a huge analysis just published of 40 studies that the tobacco industry has done on their supposedly harm reduction products that they are now advertising as factually proven reduced harm, and a lot of reduced harm. They're, they're using the word fact. The reviewer, Sophie, I can't think of the rest of her name, and four other L, uh, co authors at the University of Bath in, in England, I read this last night, they just absolutely savaged this, this review. They said of the 40 studies that have been, that they know about, not all of them have even been published, 29 have serious deficiencies, including ethical deficiencies. And so you're left with 11 studies that didn't, that they said, men, you know. So that's that's so much for what an industry right now is claiming that they, they want everybody to do because we're gonna make the world safer from smoking. We're gonna stop selling cigarettes. It's not what's gonna happen. They will never stop selling anything, whether it's cigarettes or marijuana, which they're now invested in. Philip Morris is heavily invested in cannabis. They will never stop selling it as long as they can maintain addiction, primarily nicotine addiction, but it's going to be cannabis addiction as well. Last slide, promise, they can all go home. Look who's there. Now, I, do you all remember the, the movie Titanic? Well, did everybody see the movie Titanic? When an opening scene in Titanic, remember when Rose was on the ship and she was looking at some of the artifacts that they brought from Titanic? She says, oh, look, they look just like it was when I last saw them. And she picks up the object and she turns it over and it's a mirror. She says, the reflection has changed a bit. Well, 
the reflections changed a bit. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate your coming. We did it right to the minute. And uh, if you have a chance on the way out, just glance at any of the research posters or drop me an email. I'm happy to get copies of those. But thank you so much again, and those that tuned in as well online. Another great art of medicine rants, Don, and we'll have to do it again. Thank you, Andrew. How many kind of systematic review minutes analysis style studies happen before this point? So how many can we point to? I don't, I don't think because I don't, when you look at that, it looks like an evidence-based guideline of today, practically, you know? I don't think, I, first of all, they, they never said meta-analysis. I don't think the term was even used. There. No, no. Um, yes. But when you're looking through 